Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the February Pacific Northwest Dews, Drought, and Climate Outlook webinar. Thank you to those that have joined us previously and to those joining us for the first time. Uh, just to know this webinar is being recorded and will be available on drought.gov later this week. So this bi-monthly webinar series is designed to provide the region with timely information on current drought status and associated impacts, as well as a preview of developing climatic events. This series is co-organized by CERC, NIDAS, the Northwest Regional Climate Hub, and the National Weather Service. So my name is Megan Dalton, and I am with CERC, or the Pacific Northwest Climate Impacts Research Consortium. CERC is a climate science to climate action team funded by NOAA's Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments Program. CERC acts in a supporting role for communities, policymakers, and resource managers in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Western Montana as they work to adapt to the changing climate. We do this through collaborating directly with communities and developing decision support tools. On the agenda today, we have uh, Britt Parker, um, the NIDAS Pacific Northwest Regional Coordinator, who will introduce NIDAS and the Pacific Northwest Dews. Then we have Karen Bumbako, the Assistant State Climatologist for Washington, who will present a climate recap and current climate conditions. Then after Karen, we have Dave Miskus with NOAA's Climate Prediction Center. He'll present on the climate outlook. And then Justin Huntington, who's with the Western Region Climate Center and Desert Research Institute, will present on the Climate Engine, a web-based platform for data visualization. And finally, Claire Phillips with the USDA will present on the Pacific Northwest Biochar Atlas. And just a reminder, if you have questions, please feel free to use the chat box or question box, and we'll take questions at the end or in between presentations if we have a little downtime. So with that, I will turn it over to Britt Parker. Thank you, Megan, and good morning, everybody. Um, as Megan said, I'm with NOAA and the National Integrated Drought Information System, and I'm the Regional Drought Information Coordinator for NIDAS in the Pacific Northwest and the Missouri River Basin. So I just want to take a quick um, minute or two to introduce NIDAS before we dive into all of our speakers today. So what is NIDAS, or the National Integrated Drought Information System? Um, we are a group with an interagency mandate to work with all levels, um, state, local, community, regional groups, to improve the nation's capacity to manage drought-related risks by providing the best available information and tools to assess the potential impacts of drought and to prepare for and mitigate the effects of drought. Um, we want to improve our understanding of how and why drought affects society, the economy, and the environment to improve accessibility, dissemination, and use of early warning information for drought risk management. And our approach to achieve these goals is to build on a foundation of a, the foundation of a national drought early warning system through the development of regional dues, where networks of partners and stakeholders share information and actions that help communities cope with drought. While the ultimate goal is this national early warning system, we recognize that the impacts and early warning information differ across regions. And so we work through these regional drought early warning systems. Each have many of the same basic ingredients, but ultimately have their own flavor to reflect the needs of their regions. So you can see the little diagram, the basic components we focus on are observations and monitoring, predictions and forecasting, planning and preparedness, communication and outreach, and interdisciplinary research and applications. So the intent is to build the capacity for better decision making for drought planning and mitigation. And you see a, um, the types of activities we take part in um, depending on the region we are in. So the Pacific Northwest DUES was officially launched in February 2016 after a year of scoping workshops and outlooks to collect feedback from stakeholders in the region. And the strategic plan provides a roadmap for the Pacific Northwest dues and can be found on drought.gov. And we consider this a living document with about a two year time frame for updating um, the strategic plan. It identifies existing and new drought related activities with priority areas, including improving monitoring and resource for, uh, research for drought risk management, expanding early warning communication and outreach, optimizing information and collaborative networks, and enhancing drought planning and mitigation. So finally, please mark your calendars. We do these webinars um, bi-monthly, and they're designed to provide stakeholders and other interested parties with timely drought and climate information. 
Um, and each of these webinars will be tailored to reflect the recent and current forecasted conditions. Um, the webinars and recording and other su um, supporting materials will be on drought.gov. Our next webinar is in April of 2018, and we do these on the fourth Mondays of each month. So just one quick note, after today's webinar, you'll have the opportunity to provide feedback for the first time that will help us improve on this series. So please take a moment and tell us what you think. And with that, I'm going to pull up our first presentation. Um, oops. And turn it over to Karen. And Karen, can you see your first slide? I can. It's not in presentation Great. mode, but it's there. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's um, try again. Well, I'll just go ahead and get started. That's perfect. Um, my name is Karen Bombacco. I'm with the Office of the Washington State Climatologist at the University of Washington. And you can go ahead to the next slide, Britt. Okay. So just a little recap so far, um, we're well into our 2018 water year, and this is just taking a look at the first four months of that water year. We have um, temperature on the left-hand side and precipitation on the right, and these are both um, the difference from normal. Um, so as we can see, we've definitely been on the warmer side uh, throughout the Pacific Northwest um, from October through January. Um, there is some white on this graph though, so there are some places where temperatures have been near normal for that time period as well. Um, looking at precipitation, there's definitely a large contrast between the northern and southern regions of the Pacific Northwest thus far. Um, Washington, the Panhandle of Idaho, western Montana have uh, been lucky to receive normal to above normal precipitation thus far, um, while the southern regions, um, Oregon and southern Idaho, have not been so lucky um, with below normal precipitation. Uh, next slide, please. So if you were uh, on this webinar in December, we had Donna Batsaglu talk about um, our weather in December, which featured uh, a really interesting pattern where we had uh, below normal temperatures in the lower elevations, but above normal temperatures in our higher elevations throughout the Pacific Northwest, thanks to um, a temperature inversion that was stuck over our region for a while. Um, but just looking a little closer at January, we had uh, quite a different pattern. Um, again, we have temperatures on the left-hand side. We can see it was extremely warm throughout the region for the month of January. Um, averaged over the whole Northwest, January ranked as the fourth warmest on record. Um, and that's looking at records back from 1895. Um, and then the individual states, uh, you can tell from the map that especially Idaho is warm. Um, it ranks as the fourth warmest, uh, Oregon the fifth, and then Washington the ninth. And these are some pretty sizable anomalies um, on the monthly scale, especially in Idaho. Um, precipitation, again, we're seeing a little bit of that um, dipole between the northern and southern regions where um, Washington was above normal for most of January, um, and some areas of the south were below normal. Um, next slide, please. So these plots are just looking at the daily um, temperatures. So it has the, the top of the bar is the maximum temperature, and the bottom is the minimum temperature for each day. And then those envelopes there, the red envelopes, um, show record high temperatures. Um, for the historical record, and then the blue is uh, record low, and then the green envelope is kind of your normal temperature. Um, so I like these plots, um, and it's showing uh, SeaTac Airport on the left and Boise on the right, uh, Idaho. And we can see that we had, aside from just being warmer than normal for most of the month, we had a, a much warmer than normal period mid-month, particularly west of the Cascade Mountains. Um, here in Seattle, we uh, recorded uh, 64 degrees on January 15th, which tied an all-time January high temperature. So, um, and it tied the record about a week earlier than the, uh, the previous one. Um, so pretty, pretty warm temperatures for the middle of winter. Um, Salem, Oregon, for example, saw highs in the 50s and 60s in that period. Um, and then we can see Boise on the right-hand side also had a record, a record daily high on that uh, mid-month with it looks like maybe 57 degrees uh, Fahrenheit there. Uh, next slide, please. 
So February so far, um, we are starting to see some uh, cooler anomalies uh, for Washington, uh, Idaho, Western Montana, well, actually all of Montana um, has been really cold so far in February, um, but also some temperatures that are more near normal and above um, in su uh, Southern Idaho and Oregon. Um, precipitation wide, uh, wise, we do start to see um, drier than usual so far this month um, creep into Washington, which we haven't seen too much of this water year yet. The Olympic Peninsula and then the eastern, uh, east of the Cascades has, has been drier than normal so far for February. Uh, next slide, please. But what's been uh, really interesting about this month's weather so far is last week, the cold week, uh, pretty cold week that we had. Uh, we had lowland snow on several occasions in the metropolitan regions in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, on the 20th, for example, there was about two to five inches of snow measured in Portland. Um, and then on the 22nd, we had about an inch in Seattle, but surrounding areas had between two and four inches. So on the left-hand side, is a 24-hour uh, snow map from Kokoraz um, showing uh, snow observations on the morning of the 22nd. Um, and then on the right there, we can see um, the snow water equivalent from the national uh, snow analysis. And then in the middle there, we can see from Spokane, Washington, the cold snap there too. Um, those temperature bars are well in the blue envelope there, um, indicating much uh, colder than normal for last week. Next slide, please. But I guess what we really care about is how is our snow doing in the mountains? And this is as of last week, I looked briefly this morning and the snow has improved a little more in Washington and gotten a little worse in Oregon um, since this uh, plot. But this is our snow water equivalent percent of normal. So we can see doing pretty well, uh, especially in the Northern areas of Washington, Olympics, there are some sites, uh, particularly the lower elevation sites that are lagging behind still, but really not looking great at all across the border into Oregon, um, much below normal snowpack um, in Southern Idaho as well. And then again, the winners uh, would be the Idaho Panhandle and Western Montana. So very much uh, closely follows what we've been seeing the precipitation patterns so far um, in this water year. Um, next slide, please. And these are the records um, from NRCS. And I should note that there's only about 35 to 40 years of observations here, but still um, there are several sites in Oregon and Idaho that are either the record lowest uh, snow water equivalent at this time of year um, or the second lowest, and then uh, quite the opposite in Montana with some that are the highest at this point in the year. Next slide, please. So this is just belaboring that point a little bit, taking uh, one site from each of the three states um, and showing where they are in terms of snowpack compared to normal. So the light blue line is uh, normal snowpack and then the dark blue is where we are this season. So uh, I'm glad I live in Washington, I guess I should say there. Um, and then the next slide is uh, showing the drought monitor, which I'm sure Dave will talk more about. Um, but here we can see that the drought is reflecting uh, where there's been uh, low precipitation so far this water year and where the snowpack is lagging behind in Oregon and Idaho there. Uh, next slide. And so the question is, is can we thank, and by we I mean Washington and Northern Idaho, thank La Nina. We've had above normal precipitation so far and we tip do typically see that in La Nina years. Um, as well as uh, colder than normal temperatures. Uh, the top plot, you can, it's just your standard sea surface temperature anomaly plot, um, where you can see the below normal temperatures in the tropical Pacific representing La Nina. Um, and the bottom one, folks might not be as familiar with, but it's showing um, the out, uh, outgoing long wave radiation anomalies. So in other words, the orange on that plot is showing um, where there's a suppression of convection. So in, in other words, less thunderstorms than usual. And typically we see that, in or more research has been showing lately that the further west that um, suppression of thunderstorms is during a La Nina, the greater the uh, teleconnections of that La Nina are. And they have been a little further east than what we would like to see as far as teleconnections. But in the past month, there has been a little bit 
um, more convection from suppressed in that area in recent weeks, um, which may be tied to our cold spell that we've had. Um, but I wouldn't blame La Nina for this, but particularly because we've been seeing warm temperature anomalies for most of the water year when we tend to see um, uh, colder during those years. Uh, next slide, please. And this one is the last one. So just summarizing that the water year has been warm um, despite the recent cold snap that we had in the last week. Uh, precipitation is near to above normal in most of Washington and Northern Idaho, but below normal in the rest of Idaho and Oregon. Uh, the lack of mountain snow is concerning for Oregon and Idaho, um, and that in combination with the precipitation deficit is reflected in the drought monitor. Um, I should say that um, the reservoirs are actually, all, well, let me back up. So it, although some locations have um, less snow water equivalent than usual, or sorry, I'm going to back up again. So some locations are showing record low snow water equivalent in Oregon and Idaho. The good news is that the reservoirs are actually better than uh, they were in 2015 drought, um, but we are still likely to see water supply impacts later in the season. And then finally, the pattern in the winter precipitation anomalies has not been inconsistent with La Nina since we've seen um, weather conditions further north, but the magnitude of the precipitation deficits in the central and southern portions of the western U.S. is definitely much more extreme than usual. Um, so with that, I will close. All right, thank you, Karen. Um, so next up, we have Dave Miskis of the Climate Prediction Center to uh, talk to us about the outlook. All right, sorry, this is uh, Dave Miskis from the Climate Prediction Center, and I'm going to give not only a regional Pacific Northwest view, but also a national view since uh, at the Climate Prediction Center we do outlooks and forecasts for the entire uh, U.S. here. And this is a slide I borrowed from uh, two months ago when um, this was presented, and we had a La Nina that was ongoing or about to go, and just want to let you look at that slide first of all. And that's pretty much a good characterization of what's happened so far this winter. However, I'll talk about uh, something called the MJO, the Madden Julian Oscillation, which is also kind of uh, thrown a curveball into the typical La Nina pattern, and it's caused uh, differences than we would usually expect during a La Nina, especially with respect to temperature. And that'll explain some of the Pacific Northwest warmth, where you normally would see cooler than normal conditions during the winter. All right. And I think she all, uh, Andrea Bear also showed this two months ago when she was giving this uh, presentation. Um, not all La Nina's are the same, and this one is following the same kind of script, both with respect to temperature and precipitation. And what I want to do is uh, kind of talk about the MGL, which you can give a whole webinar on that all by itself here, but I'll give a very brief description of what it is. It's pre uh, pretty much major fluctuations in the tropical circulation and rainfall that moves eastward along the equator and circles the entire globe in a span of about 30 to 60 days on average. It's tracked daily or weekly, and it's usually strongest in the Northern Hemisphere winter. And this winter, it has been meddling around with the uh, La Nina if impacts. And I wanna show a loop coming up now that kind of shows the different temperature gradients that have occurred across the U.S. anomalies uh, this winter. Um, and this will loop, there's various phases that you see on the lower right-hand side that uh, used to last for one to two weeks at a time. And so it has not kept our pattern, temperature pattern, very persistent. You get these waves of very warm, then very cold weather. And uh, we're currently in one right now. I'll talk about that for the forecast here in February and early March. Looks like uh, MGO is going to another phase one, two, which is a cold phase, but like I said, I'll save that for the forecast later. So you can see the various anomalies here that have lasted this winter from December to the end of January, and actually the one into February now, you're getting into a cold phase, um, which has really messed up the typical pattern you would see with a La Nina. So overall, my graphics aren't as nice as uh, Claire's were, but nationally, you do have the, since the water year to date, very warm above normal temperatures across the southwestern U.S., Pacific Northwest kind of near normal here from October 1st through the 25th of February here. Cold air has been spilling into the uh, northern plains as the uh, typical La Nina does 
show that. And it's been somewhat warmer than normal across the southern tier, but there's been enough of a pattern change where we've got a lot of cold air intrusion that's coming to the eastern and central part of the U.S., especially during January, early January. And it's been cold enough now to keep uh, most of the central and northeast near normal so far this winter. Uh, normally, you expect it to be warmer than normal across the Gulf Coast and up the Atlantic Coast. And so I said, let's zoom in to the Pacific Northwest since this is what this webinar is for. And showing the various is the uh, first October, November, December, where it was a little bit colder than normal in the Pacific Northwest. But since the beginning of uh, this year, you can see it's been much warmer. And overall, it's kind of near normal here in the Pacific Northwest. The further north you go, the further south you go into Oregon, warmer than normal in southern Idaho. So uh, I think Claire covered that quite well with some nice graphics, but that shows the general pattern. And the much colder air has been out towards uh, central and eastern Montana, as expected with a La Nina. Precipitation-wise, nationally, um, again, the first half, of October, November, December, very dry across the southwestern United States. And you get that uh, track coming in from La Nina where you get the storm tracks coming out of the Pacific and Canada. And you do have the above normal precipitation in uh, Idaho, western Washington. It dips across the uh, Ohio Valley, but again, very dry across the southern tier states as we would expect for a La Nina. Then since uh, January 1st here in this lower left map, uh, we've had kind of a change here, especially in February. January was pretty much followed the track of October through December, but in February we've had this storm system dipping down and drawing a lot of Gulf moisture and some Pacific moisture. And the above normal precipitation now has gone all the way down into Texas, uh, eastern Texas, all the way up into New England here. So um, that is expected. The Ohio Valley normally is wetter than normal in the wintertime during a La Nina, but it, like I said, every pattern's different. And with the MJO kind of throwing a little wrench into the La Nina typical pattern, we're getting wetter than normal weather and flooding down in the lower Mississippi Valley, uh, especially lately here and, and the Ohio Valley. But overall, that's a pretty good pattern. You get the dry across the south, like I said, except for the lower Mississippi Valley and the wetness coming in uh, in the Northwest down into Montana and the Dakotas. So again, let's zoom into the Pacific Northwest here. And again, um, November, December, January, your main month where you get most of your annual precipitation. It's most important, of course, for the snowpack for the mountains. And it's much, much drier in the summer, of course, here. So this really does matter, of course, this time of the year, the winter. And looking again at the first uh, last three months of uh, 2017, October, November, December, in the upper right, you can see what are the normal, especially in western Montana. Much drier, though, down in uh, southern Oregon, Idaho, and into California. Um, again, a similar pattern, not quite as dry uh, January and through most of February here, but uh, still below normal. And when you uh, put that all together since October 1st, you get that very dry conditions across. Uh, Oregon, Idaho, and southward, and much wetter than normal, especially western uh, Montana and northern Idaho. Washington, somewhat above normal. And she'd show the snowpack here, uh, uh, Claire did. But here's kind of a basin average now from uh, the snow tell. Again, precipitation since October 1st through February 25th. Um, above normal for, again, the further north you go, the better it is. The further south you go, it's getting below no, below average, and it's just very bad down in the uh, southwestern United States, four corner states. Snow so water content, since um, it's been cold and warm here, but overall kind of close to normal for the uh, Washington state. They're actually at or above normal for the snowpack, but again, the further south you go with less precipitation and warmer temperatures, less snowpack, and it's getting pretty dire down there, around 50% of normal on February 25th um, in parts of Oregon. And really bad down. Actually, they had a storm not too long ago in the southwest, which bumped them up. But some of these areas down in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado were down or under 10% uh, before that storm hit. So uh, still well below normal the further south you go. Uh, we talked about the La Nina right now. You normally need five periods in a row of three-month seasonal periods to have a La Nina that's minus 0 0.5 or, or more negative. We've had three so far. We're still waiting for the December, January, February period, which I'm sure will be much uh, below minus 0 0.5. So we're still in La Nina conditions. And if we get two more seasons back to back here, we'll have an official La Nina episode when that happens. The recent evolution of the SSTs in the Pacific here, you can see back in um, September when the uh, sea surface temperature started to cool in the Eastern Pacific and along the equator. And it's pretty much continued unabated here. Um, 
all the way to the date line for the most recent one we have, which was uh, through yesterday. The four different El Nino areas that we look at also, uh, all pretty much below normal sea surface temperatures, although a few of them are starting to come up towards near normal. A few of them are still going below normal here. Um, so La Nina is still quite active. There's the weekly composite here again, showing the below normal SSTs along the equatorial Pacific. We have some warm weather coming up along the South American coast here, but overall still a pretty fairly robust La Nina pattern. The um, weekly average temperature anomalies for the uh, upper ocean heat, showing again how cold it was, but we've actually had some warming recently. We turned to average values during mid-January and again during mid-February here. So possibly this La Nina is starting to run close to its end here. Now, the official forecast that came out in early February from IRI and CPC did uh, have um, a transition from La Nina to ENSO neutral conditions by the uh, spring season, March, April, May, about a 55% chance. And then thereafter, ENSO neutral conditions are favored uh, through fall of 2018 here. There is a mid-February rerun that is just done on models and um, no human interaction. So the official forecast was what you saw the previous slide. But a lot of the models now are trending towards ENSO neutral conditions near zero for the sea surface temperatures here. And this is just the model forecast. It's not the official forecast, but based on the mid-February model forecast only, they actually have a 70% chance of ENSO neutral by the spring. So we're still going with a 55% chance for the official, but the models are, like I said, it's a model. It's not always right. So that's why we have the human intervention for the early February one. But the models are trending strongly towards ENSO neutral. So the summary for ENSO right now, again, uh, we're in a La Nina advisory. Uh, this is on the February 8th advisory. La Nina conditions are present. Equatorial sea surface temperatures are still below average across the central and eastern Pacific Ocean. But a transition from La Nina to ENSO neutral is most likely during the Northern Hemisphere spring. There's a 55% chance by March, April, May season based on the official forecast. Well, let's get into the actual forecast now and outlooks here, going from day one to five, from WPC all the way out to three months uh, by CPC. Uh, in the short term, again, we have a system coming in here and actually gonna go all the way down to California. So good news here for the entire West Coast, uh, especially further south of go, they really need it. And also the good news, it's cold air is coming in here. So this should fall mainly as snow in the uh, lower to higher elevations. Uh, and snowpack is definitely needed to be built up here. because It's been pretty uh, dismal, especially the further south you go. Uh, this is the five-day forecast. So both, both the uh, maximums and minimums are expected to be below normal for the next five days, along with pretty good precipitation. The extended range forecast, which goes from days six to 10 and eight to 14, produced by CPC. This was done yesterday. Again, keeps that cold air, or should say favorable odds for subnormal temperatures in much of the uh, far west, and it continues into day 8 to 14, along with near to above normal chances for precipitation, both in the 6 to 10 and 8 to 14. So hopefully that means we'll translate to snow, building the snowpack for not only the first five days here, but out to week two. So more good news, hopefully, if you like snow. CPC week three to four temperature and precipitation outlooks, they were produced on Friday, last Friday. Again, keeps that cold air in the uh, northwestern United States and uh, odds for above normal along the uh, west coast. So again, favorable for snow uh, in the Pacific Northwest and California. Now the official CPC one month March temperature and precipitation outlooks. Uh, again, a La Nina based forecast where you keep the subnormal temperatures uh, across the Northwest into the Northern Plains. Some of the more recent forecasts for early March also go into this forecast, not only the uh, La Nina stuff. Also, um, odds for above normal precipitation, not only in the uh, northwestern United States, but also in the southeast, where they've seen quite a bit of it lately here. Uh, unfortunately, though, still below normal precipitation and above normal temperatures in the far southwest. That's not good news. Okay, the seasonal official uh, March, April, May 2018 temperature and precipitation outlooks, uh, again, very La Nina looking, but um, so we're expecting it to eventually fade away. It's gonna take a while. The atmospheric La Nina effects last longer than the actual sea surface temperatures. There's a couple months of different differential there. But again, typical warmer than normal odds for temperatures across the southern tier states and still keeping the below normal 
uh, very La Nina looking here in the uh, Northwest. Whereas again, um, you do see above normal precipitation odds in the Northwest and in the Ohio Valley. And again, the uh, below normal across the Southern tier of states. Um, Claire showed the drought monitor. I don't actually have that. I have the seasonal drought outlook, which I actually was the author of. And I keep with, based on the uh, March, April, May outlooks, we have a removal or improvement of the drought continuing across Montana. The Dakotas have been drier than normal this winter, so I didn't have favorable odds or feelings that I think they would be improving, more, most around the western part of that area. The area in Oregon, um, because the snowpack was so low, even though it's looking favorable now for the next several weeks and maybe even months, more so in the short term than the long term, um, I kept it persist, but possibly some of this could improve if we get enough snow in the next several weeks here. Um, the seasonal outlook was a little wetter further to the north and to the east, so that's why I didn't put this in an improvement area. And it's been so dismally uh, dry down in the uh, southern areas. I, it's already at D0 right now, abnormally dry. I just figured by the end of May, as it starts warming up and the precipitation normally shuts down in April, we we're gonna see at least D1 through much of this D0 area that's already exists. Uh, through California, Nevada, extending up into southeastern Oregon. But this was an improvement again. This is uh, fairly, uh, based on the WPC, I actually put that in. And then, of course, they've had all this flooding here through parts of uh, northeast Texas, uh, eastern Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Missouri. So I think this is a good call here, unless it goes bone dry for the next three months here. But like I said, the southwest is not looking very good here. Um, I'm glad they had above, somewhat above normal precipitation in the southwest last winter. So overall, the winter summary, again, U.S. winter conditions have mostly followed the expected La Nina anomalies and the CPC winter 17-18 uh, temperature precip forecast, which I'll show after this slide, especially during late 2017 and January 2018. But February has been unusually wet across the southern Great Plains and lower Mississippi Valley. Um, but it was unusually dry across the southern tier of states during um, it's normally dry, sorry. We would expect it to be dry across December, January, February, across the southern tier states. February's kind of thrown a monkey wrench into that forecast. And that's uh, the active winter MGO influence the contiguous U.S. temperatures, providing huge temperature swings during the various one to two week periods during December through February. The latest MGO forecast for January, February, March does have phase one to two, which is a cold in the west phase. Very possible here, and you're getting it right now, and it looks like the short-term forecasts have that in there. Atmospheric La Nina not only should persist for a few more months as La Nina is expected to transition to ENSO neutral by the spring. And for the Pacific Northwest during March, April, May, it looks like the short term extended range, weeks three, four, and the one to three month outlooks all favor below normal temperatures and near to above normal precipitation, especially the further north you go, which does bode well for the Pacific Northwest spring mountain snowpack and snow melt. Just very quickly, I did want to put up the uh, CPC winter forecast. We had temperature and precipitation. What I have so far, we're not quite completed the winter season, but it's looking pretty good. We have dry across the southern tier states. The area in the lower Mississippi Valley is recently from February. It was very dry before February and kind of dry across the southern tier states. So that does match up quite well for the dryness across the southern tier states. And the uh, jet stream coming in very wet up in um, Idaho, Montana, in the parts of Wyoming. And getting wet now, especially in the Ohio Valley, this uh, will probably come out to be above normal after a couple more days of wetness through this area here. So overall, pretty good precipitation forecast for the winter for the CPC. I only have through February 20 for the temperature anomalies, uh, but most of the warmth is really up in the uh, southwest into parts of the uh, Intermountain West. You do have that cold air coming in, and January is still hanging on. That very cold weather we had in January in the east is still having a below normal uh, uh, winter temperatures here, um, but it is warm across the southern tier states. So overall, not a bad forecast. We'll see if this warms up, but I don't think it's going to. We're going to probably be below normal for the winter in the uh, northeast and parts of the upper Midwest. And that's it. Any questions? All right. Thanks, Dave. We've got to keep moving on to get to the other speakers. Uh, if there's questions, we can take them at the end. Um, our next speaker um, is uh, Justin Huntington, who will talk about the climate engine. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Great. All 
All right, thanks. Um, I'm going to be talking about a web application that we created over the last couple years um, that basically facilitates cloud computing and visualization of climate and remote sensing data. And you know, this tagline, um, trying to go from archives to answers. Uh, here's a, a quick uh, image of the evaporative uh, demand drought index, Eddy, for the last 60 days. And if uh, you're like me, you've probably been mountain biking a whole lot instead of skiing. And this um, image uh, shows just uh, how how dry and warm um, it's it's been over the last uh, 60 days. So going from archives to answers, basically, um, we would really like to go from global, regional, and field scales very efficiently. And there's just really a great need to be able to quickly process and visualize this spatial climate and satellite data, as well as land surface model uh, data, um, climate model data. Um, and we really want to be able to do this for custom time periods um, and, at, and at all these different scales. And we want to try to avoid downloading and processing entire archives um, and, and be able to make these maps on the fly and be able to dynamically visualize, for example, just simple anomaly maps. Um, and not have, for example, static PNGs of anomaly maps, but be able to have that data, for example, on a Google map and be able to zoom in and draw a polygon and get time series. Um, so here's just kind of a, a little example of a global MODIS NDVI map, uh, uh, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index map for last summer, and then zooming into Moses Lake, Washington at the Landsat scale, being able to really see these, this field scale type information. So how did we start on this project? Basically, uh, the project was funded through what's called a Google Earth Engine Faculty Research Award um, several years ago. And basically, the motivation of that, that proposal was to develop a web application that allows uh, the public to perform on-demand calculation and dynamically visualize drought-related maps and time series. Now, since then, um, it, it's, it's, this uh, application has morphed uh, very uh, much uh, in the direction of uh, climate, uh, remote sensing, crop agricultural monitoring, not just drought. Um, so, uh, and also we've uh, had a lot of uh, federal uh, support from this initial private investment. So it's, it's really a, a great example of a public-private partnership where a private company uh, first invested in this and then um, many federal agencies have found this very useful. I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, colleagues from University of Idaho, John Abatsaglu and, and Catherine who have really been um, the, the leaders in terms of uh, getting the, this climate information into, into Climate Engine. And, and our team is really focused more on the remote sensing side of, of things. So, um, so what is Google Earth Engine, which is powering this whole thing? Basically, it's a massively parallel cloud computing and environmental monitoring platform. Um, and Google Earth Engine, they have uh, assets, basically copies of uh, government data in the cloud available for on-demand processing like Landsat, MODIS, ABHRR, CFSR, MARA, and LDAS, GridMet, which is John Abatsaglu's product, Global Trips Precipitation, GLDAS, and then we just recently added SNODAS. Um, basically what happens is the, the, the Google Earth Engine uh, splits up the uh, pixels into pixel blocks, 256 by 256 blocks, and and sends all these blocks out to thousands of computers simultaneously to, to process and then, and then stitches all these results back together again. Um, and it's really, uh, it's really a great uh, parallelization uh, type problem because uh, pixels are independent of their neighbors. Um, so in a couple lines of code here, I can compute uh, a conus wide Landsat max NDVI over the growing season, and it only takes a couple of seconds to actually show this. And at this scale, it uses a pyramiding scheme, so um, you don't actually have to do this at the 30 meter resolution. And as you zoom in, it starts to redo those calculations um, at a finer scale. So. That's great. Um, we have that JavaScript and Python application programming interface where you actually write code and, and get results and you can go download or export those maps. But we wanted to make a web application uh, such that it, it 
uh, does all that stuff for you by basically selecting certain assets and time ranges and calculations that you want so that anybody can do this, the public can do this, and you don't have to know how to code in JavaScript or Python to, to basically harness this power. So that's what we've done, um, developed this web application called climateengine.org, and you can get it, get, go to this uh, website at app.climateengine.org. Um, and, and really, you know, we want to be able to have anybody be able to create these maps. Um, so for example, uh, here is a modus scale NDVI map, and you can see this little polygon I drew in Southeast Oregon. Basically, I want to do a spatial average over time of both uh, the NDVI and also bring in the climate data and just plot, for example, the interannual, say, summer NDVI, which is shown in the bars, uh, with water year precipitation shown as the line, um, and, and these data are split by the mean. Um, just to see how greenness is responding um, to precipitation, for example. And you can do this in a matter of seconds and be able to download this, this graph and also get the data behind it. So um, basically, this is kind of how it works, where uh, the Google App Engine in the left side is the front-end interface, and, and that front-end is, is, is accessing data from the cloud and using Google Earth Engine for these automated uh, on-demand uh, calculations. And now we are starting to pre-compute uh, uh, data sets and, and store those data sets in the cloud and then access those data sets through the web application. Things like uh, MODIS, sur Simplified Surface Energy Balance Evapotranspiration, we have MERIT2, we have SNODAS, uh, we have the Evaporative Stress Index, many other indices that are not currently in the Google Cloud, um, that's operationally being ingested by Google Earth Engine, but we're, we're scraping FTP pages and putting them in the cloud and accessing them on our own. So here's a mapping example. This is the Warm Springs Reservation um, in Oregon, uh, summer 2015. NDVI uh, anomaly is shown as the percent difference from average, but this is Landsat. So um, basically you can process uh, the entire Landsat archive, Landsat 5, 7, and 8 archives from 1984 to 2007 to get a median uh, and then calculate the difference uh, from that median for a particular year and time of interest. In this case, uh, basically August and, and, uh, August and September of 2015. And you can see fire scars. You can see how there's stress um, in, in the range. Um, you can see some timber harvest there, those little patches just really enlightening what pops out at the 30 meter scale. And you basically, this would, a couple of years ago, this would take literally months of time to download the whole archive, store it on your machine, write Python code to be able to just compute an average and difference from average. Um, and now we can do it on the fly and be able to get these maps um, right away. So with graphing capabilities, um, you can, you can uh, basically draw a polygon or, or a, a drop a point and get a time series, in this case, precipitation from GridNet. This is near Ontario, Oregon. You can create a summary time series, so an interannual type time series, and also create a time series with statistics. So here's the, uh, the 2017 uh, through current uh, precipitation accumulation uh, near Ontario, and you can see that we're right about the 10 percentile of, of uh, precipitation accumulation so far. Um, so for example, um, like I mentioned, you can, you can drop points and get multiple time series together. You can draw a polygon around, for example, center pivot and be able to get uh, greenness information from the satellite. Um, and then also we have predefined boundaries in the tools so you can get all this information spatially averaged over Hux states, predictive service areas, grazing allotments, et cetera. Um, and like I mentioned, you can download the data. So that's the whole idea. Go from archives to answers. Don't need to download the whole entire collection and write code to make a simple anomaly map. You just create the anomaly map, draw a polygon, and it will clip out the raster data and, and basically point you to a URL where you can download the GeoTIFF. And then you can bring that GeoTIFF into a GIS package if you want to go ahead and publish that data um, or and visualize it in some other way. Um, also, you can get the Excel file for the time series and all the statistics. Um, so here's just uh, some examples uh, for uh, the recent uh, couple months. 
Um, and here's just a drop down. This is the GridMet uh, uh, um, product that within the GridMet product, we have a lot of different variables that you can access. So things like reference evapotranspiration, both grass and alfalfa reference. We have humidity, solar radiation, vapor pressure deficit, several burn indices. Um, and then also several drought indices, indices. And so what I'm showing here is SPI. Um, and this is, SPI is being computed on the fly. Um, and, and many of all these um, products are as well. Um, so here's at SPI over the last 60 days. Um, and of course, because of uh, the lower than precip conditions and also higher, uh, higher temperature and solar radiation and lower humidity, the normal, the evaporative demand has really been um, extremely high. Um, and then of course, all that has led to extremely high surface temperature. So this is MODIS land surface temperature difference from average um, over the last 60 days. Um, and I really love this product because it really illustrates um, dynamics in the land surface energy balance. Um, fire scars really pop out. Um, reduced evap evaporation, evaporative cooling obviously really pops out. Um, just really neat things you can see with surface temperature anomalies. And then of course, here is the SNODAS uh, percent of average for the last 15 days. Um, and you can see a lot of blue there on, on the coast of Washington and Oregon. That's because of the recent snowfall that you all received. And then of, of course, up in the mountains, it's not looking good. Um, but um, as uh, previously shown, that's starting to turn around um, and hopefully it stays that way for a while. So um, here's uh, uh, a look at uh, Landsat scale uh, NDVI uh, in the Treasure Valley. And the idea is, is that you can make a simple anomaly map like this and see what fields were fallowed that year and, and what fields were not. Um, and then be able to zoom in and draw a polygon around for example, uh, a center pivot here, and get the time series of NDVI um, and, and look at the crop phenology. And you can see when, when folks are, are fallowing um, and, and really be able to see this interannual and, and also um, seasonal dynamic. So the benefits of Climate Engine, we don't need to download large archives um, from and, and to servers. Um, having access to parallel cloud computing, we have this on-demand mapping and, and graphing capability, custom time periods, dynamic interface, and really the ability to access and visualize climate and remote sensing information together in, in one place, like I showed in that uh, bar chart of NDVI and precipitation time series. It's, it's great that we can look at NDVI time series, but you know, climate is driving the, the interannual variability and also seasonal variability in, in what we see from, from the satellite. So it's really important to be able to, to, be able to look at that information in one uh, place. And, and I like to say we, we are finally starting to avoid the, the processing paralysis of yesteryear that's, that's uh, plagued us for so long. Um, just a quick plug and acknowledgement, the, the web application was on the cover of BAMS in uh, last November, and just uh, really would like to thank all our um, sponsors and collaborators. Um, I want to show uh, this Space Cowboys video. Hi, hi Justin. Yeah. Um, Sorry, would you mind leaving the, the link on the site? We're running out of time, and I think uh, folks, if they could go to the website um, after the sure. webinar, that'd be great. Yeah, it's basically a, a application of this tool by the Nature Conservancy to look at uh, rangeland monitoring in Washington. Thanks. All right, thank you, Justin, and sorry to cut you short there. It's all good. Um, our next speaker is um, was invited by the Northwest Climate Hub. Uh, the Northwest Climate Hub provides farmers, ranchers, foresters, and natural resource managers with climate-informed decision support tools, adaptation strategies, and vulnerability assessments. Um, so you can visit the website um, listed for the USDA Climate Hub to get more information, and also Holly Prendeville's on the line if there are any questions about the hub that can be taken later. So the last speaker is Dr. Claire Phillips, a research soil scientist at the USDA Agricultural Research Service, and Claire will present some of her work on biochar and the Pacific Northwest Biochar Atlas. Go ahead, Claire. All right, thank you, Megan. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me to participate in this webinar. I'll be talking today about some of the adaptation work we're trying to do with, with growers 
Um, I also want to acknowledge my collaborators on this work, Kristen Tripp and Sarah Light of the ARS and Adam Lindsley at OSU helped with developing decision support tools. Um, so biochar is charcoal intended for use as a soil amendment. And we have a number of feedstocks in the Northwest, which are um, low value biomass that, are, that produce biochars with interesting properties, useful properties. And there are about generally four types of benefits that we see from adding biochar to soil. Um, it converts the carbon to a long lived persistent form that isn't easily degraded. So there's a carbon sequestration benefit. There's um, often ash as part of the biochar that provides a liming benefit. There's fertility benefits. And there's also changes that can um, increase the porosity of soil and improve water retention um, and or infiltration. And so in 2016, with funding from the Northwest Climate Science Center, we looked at whether biochar additions to soil could be useful as a drought adaptation tool and added biochar to field plots at a number of extension stations. And I'll show you results from these four sites today that represent a range in soil textures and climates that we experience in Oregon. And we tilled in the biochar in the fall of 2016. And the following spring came back and sampled to look at changes in the physical properties. And what I'm showing here, the top um, set of panels is the saturated water content. And so you can see that with increasing biochar amendment rates, the total water holding capacity increased pretty substantially. And then the bottom set of panels is showing the plant available water, that amount that remains after free drainage. And this was more modest, but still significant for most of these soil biochar combinations. And just to quantify that, um, a 1% addition of biochar by mass resulted in up to a third of an inch per foot more available water. So this won't be a panacea to our drought um, challenges that we faced here, but this is a useful tool, particularly for growers that can take advantage of the multiple benefits of biochar. So producers that um, have acidified soils and would also benefit from the liming aspect, benefit from the fertility aspect, or if they are, um, for instance, have an animal operation and are using biochar for manure, odor controls, and then applying it to their field. So if they're doing joint operations or have vegetation management that could produce a feedstock. So um, we wanted to produce an outreach tool that would help address not just the moisture aspects of biochar, but we felt it really had to help users understand the, the, the complete system effects of biochar. So how biochar is affecting their soil in multiple ways. And um, there was an, there had been a real information void. So there's few general recommendations for users on how to apply biochar. And most of the research is looking at one plant and one biochar, whereas biochars produced from different materials have very different physiochemical properties. And there's also no labeling requirements and limited information about where to procure biochar. And so we developed the Pacific Northwest Biochar Atlas, which is a, a web resource with um, three main goals in mind. We wanted to provide predictive decision support tools. Uh, we wanted to share experiences from early adopters. And um, we wanted to um, help potential users find biochar. And so I've pre-recorded a screen capture video here, which I'm starting. Um, and so I'm going to talk over it. And a visitor to the landing play, uh, page can learn about these different things, the basics of biochar and how it's produced at different scales of production, um, benefits with some stories here in the Northwest about biomass utilization, converting juniper to biochar, um, its use in agricultural systems. They can read case studies from different farmers at different scales of production, from blueberries to wheat. We have eight case studies posted so far. These are the decision support tools here that a user would be linked to. 
and then they can find a directory of biochar producers or companies producing equipment, pyrolysis equipment, for, um, for the end user to make their own biochar. So I'm going to show you some of the tools. We created four related tools in our toolkit. And um, the premise here is the user needs to start with some information about their soils to make decisions about whether biochar amendment would be useful to them. And it's best if a user has soil test data, but if they don't, we wanted to provide ability to easily access the soil survey data from the Sergo database. And so we created this soil data explorer where a user can enter their address. And here I'm entering my location at the Forge Seed Research Unit. And it pulls up the soil survey data that's relevant to understanding biochar's impacts. And so here I'm going to click on the sheep pasture across the street. And on the right side, you see the um, soil map unit. It's at Amity Loam. And you can click to view its soil texture, um, its water holding capacity, and also chemical properties if, they're, if this information is available for the map unit. And then the user can take this information and pull it into our biochar selection tool, which is really the keystone of this toolkit that guides the user from um, analyzing their soil properties to selecting a biochar that might be appropriate for their needs. Um, so we'll get started here with this tool. And we start with asking the user to provide information about their soil. They can also populate these cells from the map if they've already selected a location. It brings in information about carbon content, fertility, pH, and texture. And then um, the user here can read about how um, biochar may benefit in terms of these, these four categories of effects and see how their soil stacks up. So in this case, the sheep pasture soil um, is a map unit that's low in organic matter, and so the user may benefit from the carbon aspects. Uh, they can look at fertility and also select uh, a crop. So in this case, we'll look at uh, pasture, and this pulls in the fertilizer and liming recommendations from OSU Extension, and so they can view how their soils current fertility compares to what's recommended for that crop. And they can view nutrients that are provided by biochar, which include phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, magnesium. They can look at whether they are in need of liming and whether biochar would provide that benefit. And then finally, they can look at the moisture aspects. Um, and the guiding principle here is that fine textured soils may benefit from an improvement in infiltration by biochar amendment, and coarser textured biochar, so coarser textured soils may benefit from an improvement in water retention. And so this guides the user through that understanding. Um, and so after this analysis, the user's prompted to select up to three goals for biochar amendment. Um, so we'll leave the first priority here is sequestering carbon and then select a different goal for the second priority. We'll select increase plant nutrients. Let's say any we want any nutrients improved. And then as a third goal, we'll um, want to increase water infiltration. And the user can click on view the recommendations. And what we've done is compiled a database of about two dozen biochars produced from Northwest feedstocks. And we show them which biochars in our database are best suited to meeting the, those goals. And so we have a collection of both commercially produced biochars and ones produced in laboratories from relevant feedstocks. And over time, our, our goal is to um, build this library and allow users con to contribute data about biochars that they're working with. And this summary table puts together their different priorities and shows the user that one biochar may not meet all of their goals. And this helps them to um, determine, sorry, this is going too fast, pause it. Um, it helps the user to um, identify which biochar 
may address their, their top priority. And then the last aspect of this biochar selection tool is showing the user um, what a different amendment rate would translate to in terms of the stable carbon um, built up in the soil and the amount of different nutrients that the biochar could provide. So the user can select a different biochar that they're interested in. Um, let me get my mouse back. And view those, um, the nutrient, the lime, and the stable carbon contributed. And at this point, we didn't have enough information. There really hadn't been enough research to make recommendations on how much water storage is increased. And so our goal over this coming year is to combine our research results with a data synthesis. There's been a, a much increase in research on this topic over the last two years, so we can make some storage estimators for this tool. So those are two of our tools. We have an economic analysis, uh, a cost-benefit analysis tool as well. Um, but I'll leave it there and I'll say what we're looking towards over the next year to improve this is, um, First of all, synthesizing water studies, as I'd mentioned. Also workshopping the tool with different user groups to get their feedback, and we're targeting especially drought-impacted producers, um, grape growers in Southern Oregon, ranchers in juniper-impacted areas in um, Wheeler County in Eastern Oregon. Um, and we're also looking to build more case studies from early adopters across the Northwest. And that's what I have to share. <laughs> All right, thank you, Claire. And it looks like we've unfortunately run out of time on today's webinar, but Britt Parker put her contact information in the chat box. So if there are questions, go ahead and give her uh, an email, or uh, I know some of the speakers put their contact info and feel free to reach out to them directly. So thanks again to all of our speakers and thanks to everyone for joining us and we'll see you on our next webinar in April. <laughs>